Welcome to Transformative Principle, a proud member of the Bean Podcast Network, the best educational podcast network out there. You get a show for every role that you are in education. If there's not one for you, let us know. I'm your host, Jethro Jones. I'm happy to have on the program Rick Meyer. He's an elementary principal in Sydney, Nebraska. He's been in education for 19 years, the first seven as a kindergarten teacher, and then he transitioned to a technology coordinator for his district for the next five years, where he helped implement technology and taught kindergarten through fifth grade technology integration. He then moved into administration as in his seventh year as a principal. Meyer is married to another elementary principal in Sydney, and they have two children, a daughter, 16, and a son, 12. He holds a master's degree in administration and is currently working towards a specialist degree to become a superintendent. Meyer has been passionate about technology and education since he entered teaching. Rick, welcome to Transformative Principal. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Jethro. It's great. Man, I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about today. What is your big takeaway? Uh, the big takeaway probably for this is going to be empowering people to understand that we can make systems work and we can get data in teachers' hands in ways that they're going to use it and, and put it in place without having to be stressed, without having to do extra things, without having to do extra work, make it easy for them. They're busy enough. They're busy enough as it is. Uh, we got to use technology as an ally. We got to let it do the heavy work, heavy lifting, and we do the application part. Yeah, very true. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, for me, the thing that is so valuable is you go through how you built this thing, this teacher data hub, and how it is so easy for teachers to access it. And we're going to dive pretty deep, and this is a pretty long episode for that reason. But man, it is so worth the time to look at this and see what it looks like and see how it can help you do a, something similar at your school. And I'm just excited about what you've created. I think it's really powerful. And um, and I see I see a lot of potential for you to uh, make it easy for your teachers to see what they need to see. And, and I just think it's really cool. So we're gonna have my interview with Rick here in just a moment. But first, just wanna say, uh, if you go to transformativeprinciple.org, the show notes for this page will have a YouTube video on there as well where we have blocked out the kids' names and you'll be able to uh, see what we're talking about. Uh, but it won't have any kids' names on it uh, so that we can protect their identity. And I think that uh, I just really appreciate Rick sharing this data and help and how he's created it. So here comes my interview with Rick in just a moment. Uh, so Rick, first, let's start out by you talking about this data hub that you've created. Uh, tell us what it is first and what it uh, what your goal is with it. Yeah, so when I uh, was first principal, my first year principal, being a principal, um, kind of jumped into um, test scores, all that good stuff again. I had been in technology for a little while, so I kind of got to take a little reprieve from worrying about assessments and that data part. Um, so jumping back into it, um, I found a real need for getting information to teachers um, in an easy way, in an easy format. Uh, and it kind of started with our progress monitoring that we did. So we would do progress monitor monitoring for each of our students every single week, but our teachers never saw that data. And so then the only data points they were seeing was when we did the big assessments, you know, at the very beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end. And so we had all that gap in between um, and nobody really knew about what was going on. So I kind of started from there um, and then decided, well, instead of just sharing just their scores, let's share their starting scores and then let's share their middle scores and then let's share where their percentiles are at and their goals. And it just kind of started snowballing from there, kind of. Um, and so then we started bringing in, hey, if we're collecting data on we have a program called Raider Badges, so it's our, our PBIS incentive. If we're collecting data on that, I should get that to the teachers. And so it kind of just grew from there. Um, and, and it became anytime we were collecting data, I wanted it in this one spot so that teachers didn't have to go to this website for these, to this other website with this other login for this. Um, I've got some pretty tech savvy teachers, but then I have some others too, that it's, this is, that's a struggle to go jump back and forth with. And, and the time it takes to do that, uh, it just wasn't happening on an accurate basis. And so, you know, when we started getting into MTSS, um, we were very reactive 
until we started kind of building in our hub and our data. Um, and then that flipped the script. And then we became proactive because those conversations happened every week when we saw scores, not where we wanted them at. I, uh, this is just so incredible. And when you showed me this a couple of weeks ago, I was like, man, this is exactly what every teacher needs. And it's exactly what we should have because the technology exists and we really should be able to access it much easier than we do now. And the problem mm -hmm. is that everybody's got their systems and everything's siloed within those systems. And what you've done is you've taken it out of those silos and made it accessible all in one place. Now, yeah. there are a couple things that work for you because of who you are. Number one, you're obviously a big nerd, right? And <laughs> Extremely, you, yeah. you love doing spreadsheets and stuff like that. And not everybody can do that, but mm -hmm. everybody can do a little bit of that. And it may be challenging, but I'm sure there's someone on your staff who could do something like that and who could help with this aspect of it. So that's the first thing. The Because the first complaint people are gonna say is, well, I don't understand spreadsheets, and I don't know how to do this myself. And yeah. that doesn't matter. Somebody on your staff could help with this and help make it happen. It oh, doesn't yeah. have to be you. It just happens to be Rick because this is Rick's nerdiness. And well, and I tell you, I wasn't. I wasn't this way though. I, I mm. didn't know a lot about spreadsheets when I first started. I was. I was a faker, big time. You know, all I used it for was making schedules look pretty. You know, I didn't do anything with formulas. I didn't do any of that stuff. I kind of taught myself. And I'll tell you, the most. Of the, I have some pretty complicated formulas in here, but a lot of the stuff that I bring in is really not. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's a lot of like uh, just kind of simple ones. And once you get the idea and the hang of it once, it's pretty simple to replicate. Uh, and that's kind of what I've, I've done here. So yeah, yeah I've, I've self-taught myself all of this stuff. Um, it, and like I said, some of this stuff gets in there. It does get pretty nerdy for sure. Um, but, but it's not something that nobody else could do. The whole thing is in Google sh uh, spreadsheets. That's it. So it's, yeah. it's pretty simple, pretty easy to go. Yeah. So so we'll let's talk about the... It's called a tech stack in in the, the startup world. What what's the technology that you're using? You're just using Google Sheets, so you're yep. pulling everything from all these other places and putting it into Google Sheets at, yep. as as a basic, right? Uh, what else do you want to say about where you're getting your data? Um, well, a lot of the data entry comes from Google Forms, and that's it. So I have a Google Form that goes right into some spreadsheets, and then it just all goes to where I want it to from there. And mm -hmm. and so truly everything that's in here. Um, it's all Google Sheets, Google Forms. That's it. Yeah. And so, who is uh, who is entering the data is another question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, some of the data, like the the main test scores, are entered either by myself or my instructional coach. You know, we after the big uh, we do our maps assessments at the beginning of the year, our Acadians assessments. You know, those we put in those. Uh, the progress monitoring is all done by our paras. So our paras will do the monitoring in the hallway. They get those scores, they tally them up, they enter those on a Google form. Um, the student data that comes in from our Raider badges programs, the students input that data in there. Uh, so they get on a Google form. When they come down to my office to get a Raider badge, they put that in themselves. Um, our daily check-ins that we do with our students are also done by them as well. So in the mornings, they get on their iPads, they get their Google form up, they fill it out and it's done. So teachers don't put any data in. Um, it's, it's all done either by paras uh, and students for the majority of it. And then some of that big stuff, the big scores are done by myself or an instructional coach, which takes very minimal time. Yeah. I mean, those are like big tests that you're putting in maybe two or three times a year. Yeah, not three. Three times a year because it's, it's that, uh, are you guys using map? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're putting the map scores in three times per year and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that's, that's like a big task to do that once, but you only do it three times a year. The progress monitoring, having the paraprofessionals do it when they're, they're doing it. I mean, that's really a training thing. Teaching them how to record that data is really all that that comes down to. And same thing with the kids entering their own data in, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's really powerful. So yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through some of this data. And if you're listening, uh, we hope that it will still be valuable for you to hear us talking about it and what's there. But we're also recording a video of this. So you'll be able to see what Rick is talking about on my YouTube channel. 
and that will be linked in the show notes at transformativeprinciple.org. So you'll be able to see it as well as hear it. But I believe we're going to do a pretty good job of making it uh, visible through just hearing it. So don't stress. And if you're listening to it and you're like, man, I really should go back and watch that later. Here's a little trick. Uh, share it with a principal friend. This is this is how I suggest you do it. You take the link of what you're listening to and you say, hey, we should watch this together or talk about this and share it with somebody else so that you can easily find it from a text message that you send to somebody else. That's really, I think, one of the best ways to do it. Okay, so Rick, let's let's dive in and talk about uh, each of these things. The, the no. first thing that I want to note is, like you said, everything's in Google Sheets, so it's one mm -hmm. place that you're that everybody's going to focus. And teachers aren't entering data. Teachers are using this to get data and see that data on a regular basis. So let's start with what are the things that people look at every day and every week and then less frequently? What are the, the dashboards or the hubs that you've built for those different daily, weekly, whatever check-ins? Yeah. So um, the part that I'm actually the most excited about, we've just entered in the, this year, is um, our check-in and kind of our attendance data. This is checked by teachers every single day. And so this front dashboard here has a breakdown of all of our students. So every student comes in first thing in the morning, they fill out their Google form with how are they feeling? So they have the, there's six emotions, worried, sad, tired, mad, angry, happy, excited, and content. And they pick one of those choices. That's how they're feeling in the morning first thing. And so then the teacher's able to kind of see where their class is at. Cause we've all had those students that come in, um, and they're just, you know, they're down, but they don't really show it. And so then something happens. They're not working very hard. Teacher gets on them a little bit. They end up coming down to me. And then we find out, oh, they had a terrible night last night. So we're trying to get a, be a little proactive with this little daily check-in. Uh, we're using this in our district from kindergarten all the way up through sixth grade. And so I have first and second graders. So it's a very simple, how are you feeling? Um, our fourth or third through sixth graders have some additional questions too. Anything you'd like to tell us about? And those sorts of things as well. So for ours, it's pretty simple. And um, if I can interject here, yeah, uh, I just want to note that the you have averages on there of how kids are feeling, and the average per day for tired in August was forty eight point nine. Mm -hmm. Is is that percent or numbers? What is that? Uh, that is the number. That's a, that's the that's what I mean. We averaged per day. Okay, so forty nine students basically per day in August were feeling tired. Uh, and then you go down to November, which is the first full month completed or last full month completed. And it's more than cut in half. It's down to 20.7 kids are feeling tired. And I just think that is really fascinating information that mm -hmm. you can see basically, uh, what is that? Almost a fourth of your, or a little bit more than a fourth of your students were tired and yeah. now uh, it's significantly less than that. That's pretty yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So on this main dashboard, exactly what you can see is you can see our averages that we had per day or per month um, with each of the different um, emotions. And then we also have an average um, per day of the week. And so you can see a percentage um, on each day of the week. So you can kind of tell what days are going to be the hardest days for our students. And so, you know, tired is the highest percentage on Mondays, and then it kind of slowly goes down. Um, and then, you know, what days our kids are the most mad and angry, um, you know, those sorts of things. So they, you can, all the teachers can see this general information right here, just kind of in a snapshot. This is more for me. I also share this out to uh, parents as well. So we just completed November. So I'll put November's in a big pie chart on Canva. I'll share that out as an announcement. And so we've had a lot of great communication with parents due to that. And just like you had said, with our tired numbers going way down, um, a lot of that was just awareness from parents. We had a lot of parents who said, you know, I had my kid go to bed and then I found out later on they were staying up watching TV. And so mm -hmm. some of those things kind of got fixed, which is nice. Um, so that's kind of the main dashboard. It kind of shows you where we're at. Uh, I have a yearly information, so it kind of shows you through, through the whole year. Um, and there's also a daily over here, and it usually compares it to the day before, although today's Monday, so I didn't have any data from yesterday. Otherwise, yeah. that would be filled in too. So then the, the teachers have a spot where they just can click on their name, and it bounces right down into their spot. And they can get a, 
a couple of things right away that they can see. They can pull any student from their class and see a historical record of how they've checked in with the most recent at the top. And so we can mm -hmm. see kind of trends of students. And then in the middle, it shows what students have checked in and what students have not checked in. So uh, it can easily kind of check this quickly and see if somebody's gone, they're gone. If they're not, you can tell them, hey, don't forget to check in this morning. And so it kind of gives them an idea to do that. And then this is the most powerful part is it shows you all students in your class that marked sad, tired, worried, or mad and angry. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kids that you have to check in with. And so you just, hey, what's going on? I saw that, you mo that you're tired. Did you get enough sleep last night? You know, just those conversations, those quick conversations. And then more important than that is the awareness for the teacher. So if they're aware that these kiddos are tired, you know, I'm not going to push on them as hard, you know, to get all of their stuff finished or make sure that they're attentive all the time. I'm not going to ride them like I may, you know, thinking that they were just kind of being disrespectful or rude, something like that. Okay. Um, so this, this is really powerful because you now have this short list of, uh, seven students in this example mm -hmm. that are not feeling great and in, in whatever way. Most of them are tired, two are sad, mm -hmm. one is mad or angry. And mm -hmm. you can see that right away as soon as the students check in and then you have information that you can then do something with. And every teacher is going to approach that differently with each individual student. This is what is so incredibly powerful is that if uh, Stacy is feeling mad or angry. I'm going to react to Stacy differently being mad or angry than I am to Michael being mad or angry. And mm -hmm. I know that, but if they're saying that they're feeling that way, they're signaling to me that that's going on. Now, here's the other powerful part. Kids could, of course, lie on this and say, I'm feeling fine and still be grumpy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And even if they do, like that's not the end of the world. But if they're being honest and saying, this is how I feel, you at least have a heads up. They could also lie and say they're not feeling great so that you do go easier on them, even if they don't really need that. Again, that's not the worst thing in the world, Rick, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we also have we'll, every month. So we're sending a report home um, today that shows an updated list each kid individually, what they have, and that goes home to parents. So parents can get an idea and see you know, how their, how their year is trending out. Um, they, and they can have those conversations with them. So if a student is coming in every day and they are not being truthful, uh, we had this happen where a student was marking tired every single day. And mom said, wait a second, you go to bed at eight o'clock every night. You go to bed, you wake up all, all right, you're just fine. Are you really tired? Do we need to bump a, a bedtime back? And then all of a sudden, no, you know, I'm not really that tired. I just kind of am just putting that instead. And so those conversations that are happening at home that's that's been huge that's been a big part of it too and, and we've been able to open that communication with them through this and none of this has to be punitive in nature right no it right. can just be hey i noticed that you're feeling tired all the time like what's going on what do mm -hmm. we need to do like there are all kinds of ways to talk about that punitive is one of those ways but there are all kinds of ways to talk about that that don't result in you know kids being uh isolated or feeling like they're being singled out or anything like that. I think right. that that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. I mean, and that's what we talk about. We're, we're talking about feelings and having kids recognize their own emotions and others emotions as well, too. This is another great way of just being able to have those conversations. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So teachers look at this every single day. Every kids day. are entering this data and teachers are just waiting for them to enter it so they can mm -hmm. see what's going that's on. It. As a teacher, all you have to do is just follow up to make sure everybody checks in and then check your data and that's it. Yeah. Um, the, the one extra really powerful piece about this as well too is I have a principal counselor tab. Um, so when you go over to the principal, principal and counselor, what we've done is we've taken every student out of, the, out of the entire school that marked worried or that marked mad and angry because we feel like another adult should check in with those kids. And so either my counselor or myself will go and find that student in the morning just to make sure everything is going okay. Just make sure everything's fine. Uh, if there's something that, you know, we need to help out with or can help out with, um, we do. And then it kind of gives us a heads up too. some of these students that end up on this list sometimes end up coming down to my office for a little bit. And if I have that that background of what's going on with them in the morning or what happened over the weekend or whatever, um, that definitely changes how we process with them. Um, yeah. and, and we don't want we don't want everybody 
piling on this kid. And so we have little check boxes that are here. So if my counselor checks in with the student, she hits a check box. If I do, I do the same. That way we are not both double teaming this kid. Um, and this all resets every day. So every day when new information comes in, check boxes are all cleared out again, new kid names come in. So we're ready to roll. We have, we don't do any work to it other than just check it and then follow up with kids. Mm -hmm. And, and what's so cool here is that you're now being proactive with your day, going and finding kids that may be struggling, maybe dealing with something and you're, instead of waiting for them to blow up and have to come to you in a, I'm in trouble position, you're getting out of your office and going and checking in with them. I mean, you could be in their classroom three minutes after they finish this and be providing support that quickly, yep. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's oftentimes what we do. My counselor's fantastic at this. She's actually the one that brought it, the idea to our school because she was doing this before. Um, I just put this all together with the data part and, and said, hey, we can we can make this an easy like addition to our data hub for sure. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's kind of where this kind of went to. But yeah. And then how does this work with attendance as well? Yeah. So that's been what I would really love to see um, is is to have some attendance reports as well. Cause we can pull those off of, we have power school. So we can pull that off of power school. Um, it's pretty easy to do, but not for teachers. It's not, they don't do it very often. No. So that's not something they're going to do. Um, the, the kicker is since this is year one, we haven't had it um, accurate enough to pull attendance data from, but that's my idea. That's my goal is if we can have kids, you know, reliably checking in every single day, then we also have attendance data that I don't have to pull from power school. I have it right here because yes. if you didn't check in, it's because you're not there. And yeah. so we've had to, we've had to work through some ways of, you know, when kids come late, how do they get checked in? Because school's already started, you know, so they, you know, any students who are late, they come check in on an iPad by my office now. So we've kind of worked some of that out. Um, it just took us a little bit. So I don't, so starting the year next year, attendance, I think will be another part that we add to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's really powerful also like this, the idea of taking attendance that teachers have to be the ones to take it is crazy. The idea mm -hmm. that uh, parents have to like actually call in and excuse their kid when really they should be able to text in or select a, my kid's absent today. Um, yeah. Those kinds of things are just inefficiencies that drive me nuts because mm -hmm. it, they just take so much time. I We had a student information system for my teachers where they had to spend like two minutes and do like 50 clicks to change yeah. attendance from absent to tardy. Mm -hmm. And they just stopped taking attendance at the beginning of class because it was too much of a pain. And mm -hmm. what's the point when you get right. to that, that level of intensity, it's just like, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And teachers are busy enough. That's the whole point yeah. of this data hub was, you know, if I want them to collect the data, if they have to collect it, they have to organize it. They have to, there, it's not going to happen. It's yeah. just not going to. So, you know, there's, there's ways of technology can do that hard work for you easily, you yeah. know? And, and with the system you've created, it's very easy for the teacher to have this as a bookmarked save tab that they open mm -hmm. up every single day and they can go right there to their own thing. You see all the teachers, but they just need to see themselves and they can open that up and see that uh, pretty easily without a lot of like way easier than logging into PowerSchool, for example. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's what our teachers just have this tab open on their computers all the time. And, and you are no more than three or four at most clicks away from the data that you want to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, incredible. Okay, so that's our check-in attendance day. That's what we look yeah. at every single day. Anything else they look at every single day? Uh, no, not every single day. So then it, from from the daily stuff, which is the, the check-in stuff, then we go into kind of the weekly stuff. So um, this is kind of the start of where I had to put the data hub and, and it's kind of evolved from here. But weekly, we take progress monitor scores for students who are identified as needing um, or not efficient in, in Acadians is what our, our screener is for that. Um, so I added to this as well. So we have a, a phonics program called Sunday Phonics. And so um, I have a pacing guide kind of on this. So you can kind of get an idea of where each kid is at and what lesson they're in um, based off of their last mastery check that they've taken. And the mastery check is done after every five lessons. So students, and the reason why we have this is, is we don't do like a walk to read like we used to. So we have our, our kids are in just their normal homeroom classes. 
but we do sometimes have some outliers that might not fit within a low group or a high group. And so we do have a little bit of that flexibility. So as a teacher, I could easily see um, if my student is not fitting in, what group could they fit in without having to have instruction that they've already received or have to skip lessons. And so we kind of have this, this basically this pacing guide for the staff. Um, all the names are color coded as well. And that's also strategic because it's based off of their map scores. So in our action plan, we identify students that we want to uh, really focus on, you know, not necessarily do extra things for, but if I'm teaching a lesson, I want to make sure that this student understands what we're teaching. I want to make sure I always circle around their desk in independent time. Um, and those are our kids who are in the 20th to the 60th percentiles in maps, which are coded by yellow and orange. So when you look at your class and you see, you're getting that reminder every time you see it of what kids are in what we call our super group. And so that's, so I try to throw that stuff out there as much as we possibly can. And that was super simple to do, just a little bit of um, conditional formatting based off of their scores and all their names are gonna be highlighted the way they need to be. Um, then when you go down to the actual teacher's data, it's going to show, this is where it kind of breaks down individually. So each individual student, they have a drop down of all of the names of their kids in their class. This is tied to our main um, spreadsheet with class lists in it. So my secretary, anytime we have a new student adds to that spreadsheet, it automatically gets updated here. It's not something that anybody has to go back. We, oh yeah, I got to add this kid to this and to this and to this. It's all done automatically. Um, but and if I may, Rick, yeah. this is a really powerful uh, thing to highlight because what you're basically saying is that there is a single place that has the the true record, the truth about who is who and where they're at. Mm -hmm. And if you don't keep that one thing updated, all of these other things are dependent on that. And so they won't be updated themselves. And if so, if somebody goes and adds data in the wrong place, then it, it ruins the system and you set it up intentionally so that that is not happening. Is that correct? Right, right, exactly. So anytime, like I said, anytime a new student comes in, instead of me having to go find every single spreadsheet that we have class lists and names on, they're all tied to our main list. So if that's updated by my secretary, that student's name is going to show up here and we're ready to start collecting data on them from day one. Yeah, uh, which is also amazing because getting names and information into uh, third party systems can be a real pain to make that it, happen. It is absolutely. And then it also takes the human error out. So, you know, like on spreadsheets it is, and sheets, if you type a name wrong, it's going to show up as a different entry, you know, mm -hmm. and I've taken that out. So it, it just needs to be put in one time, one place, and everything else is going to match up with that. So, um, as my teachers go in here, they, they know which students are, are being progress monitored so they can select them. They can select actually any student that they want to, and they're going to see a couple of things. First, they're going to see all of their scores because I always want to throw that in there. Let's get a reminder of what percentile are these students at. Um, and then you're going to see your progress monitor scores. Like I said, this was the origin of this data hub was just getting this data to teachers. And so there's going to be a red line and a blue line. Our red line is what we call ambitious growth. And then you're going to see the blue line, which is their scores. So any teacher, and this one just happens to when I pulled up is she is right on her ambitious growth line trend, which is yeah. perfect. So That's as a awesome. teacher, if you're seeing that, you're saying what we're doing is working. Let's keep on it. And then you can also see her Sunday phonics mastery check scores. And so this is, this is our main reading instruction that we do. And so if a student is consistently passing those scores and they're projected really well, nothing to worry about. We know exactly what that kid's going to do and we're feeling good about it. Um, if I pick a different student here, um, this is not a progress monitor student. Let me see if I can't find one here. Um, here's another student here, a little different data. So mm -hmm. this is a student, obviously, who's kind of plateaued a little bit, had one little spike on progress monitoring. And since then it's kind of flatlined and kind of gone down a little bit. So this is a student that this is what we want to work with. This is, a, this is our MTSS process right here. This is the teacher I'm going to go. This one, this student happens to work with our title teacher. So there's going to be a lot of collaboration between our instructional coach, our classroom teacher, our title teacher, because we see the data. We're not waiting until January when we do our test to see if she made it and hoping we know, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so that's, that's kind of the, this is the weekly one. So every Friday or whenever they want to, 
uh, they get on and take a look at the new scores because new scores are added every single week. Usually we, te- we progress monitor on Thursday. Those scores are in on Thursday. So Friday, their graph looks different. Yeah. And, and what's so cool about this is that the there's not double recording because the paraprofessionals are putting their data in this one thing. And so they don't have to go put it in two different places to meet somebody else's needs. They put it in one place. Teachers get to see it virtually instantaneously because it gets updated as soon as they put that data in. And this progress monitoring data comes in via a Google form as well. Is that right? Yes, it does. So tell us about that process. What does the paraprofessional see when she puts it in? So the, the para just has, so um, their form has all the kids that they progress monitor. They just click the kid's name, they click their score, and then they go, add, go into the next one. It, it takes yeah. maybe five minutes if you have all the booklets all ready to go. Yeah, piece of cake. Yep, and, exactly. And very uh, minimal chance for error because you're mm-hmm. choosing the specific kid. Now, what mm-hmm. happens if they put the wrong uh, kid in and then they fix it and, and do the right kid? Then there's going to be two points of data. Uh, yeah. Do they just let you know and then you go delete that one? Yeah, some some let me know. Others know how to jump into spreadsheets and then they just delete the line. That's gotcha. it. Pretty simple. It and, just depends on their level. But. And, and once that data is gone, it's just not pulling from that report. So it's not like it's it's not it's not like that ruins anything. It's just not pulling that particular data entry and then you're fine. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that you. it's really pretty tough to screw it up. It really is. Yeah, so go ahead and while you're in here, click on cell uh, C121. Okay. Okay, so looking at this, you're doing a, a formula to go mm-hmm. look up that particular score that somebody entered somewhere else. And and the reason yeah. why I'm highlighting this is that the the data that people are seeing here in when the teachers are looking at this, They don't go in and change this data here because it's pulling from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so they don't even need to worry about it because they know that it's there and they know that it's accurate because they trust that people are filling this out correctly, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of one of my, it's what I call my security system. I've got a lot of import ranges. Um, So I have like my main spreadsheet that has all of our test scores. That one's locked down. So there's only two people that have access to that and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then everything else feeds from that, but you can't change any score. You can't fudge anything. Um, that's all a hundred percent locked down because you, nobody has access to the original. And then what I just do is I just import those scores into my, whatever sheet I have. Um, and like I can click over here and you'll see, I have a bunch of hidden tabs, a bunch, Mm -hmm. um, because it's all that back end stuff, um, that I don't need seen and it doesn't make sense but it makes sense on these. So, yeah. so yeah. So I have just a simple, like a, a H lookup. And what it does is I have all scores that get dumped into one big tab. And so as every score from every kid and they're all organized by date, because when you enter in a Google form, it has a timestamp on there. And so even if, even if our, even if our para is, let's say we have a sub and our para doesn't do the entry of the, the, uh, scores that week and they have to wait till the next week as long as they do them sequentially so if they you know week four they put that in first then week five is next even if they did them right after each other it's still going to show up here just fine you know so it's it's that sort of stuff that it, it took me two minutes to explain that to them they all understand that so yeah they, they can fall behind and have to make it up in the next week or two weeks i mean we've had it we've had it where a pair has been gone for a couple weeks you know, and they've had to make up scores by putting them in because somebody else did them for them. Um, really easy to do. Super simple. Yeah. And and that at that point becomes like, oh, man, we don't have data on this kid. Where in the past, like we just didn't have data on any kids. And now mm-hmm. it's just that one pair's group of kids that we don't have data on. Right. Yeah. And those are very, it doesn't happen very often. Few and but far between. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the same thing here, like I just pull it, uh, queries. I do a lot of those. Uh, those that's a super powerful formula. Um, and so I, I pull in, what it's going to do is it's going to look at this drop down cell here, whatever, whatever name is in that, it's going to go find that student on my score sheet. And it's going to go look for uh, the column that has their fall score in it. 
And it's, so if I, anytime I change any of these students, it's going to change it for me here automatically. Cause it just goes and looks based off of the entry of this, which is just a drop down. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, mm -hmm. what should we talk about next, Rick? Okay. Um, probably. So these other ones here, so that's the, the weekly one, the daily one, those are, I'm pretty, pretty strict on the rest of them are about like a once a month or as needed. So, um, our Raider badge one, this is probably the next one that I'll, I'll talk about. And this one, I might break off into another spreadsheet too, cause I have some backend stuff that I just see on this one. Um, so we're a, a PBIS school. And so one of the things that we do is that we um, give out Raider badges for our students and they can be earned for anything. So we have a, a list of uh, all of the Raider badges that are kind of earned over here. We have them from our math program, which is Zern Math. Um, we have just generic math badges. We have good friend badges. We have social detective badges, spelling master badges, pretty much anything you can think of that a student might work on here at school you can earn a badge for. And a badge is just a, like, it's a little one inch button. That's all it is. Um, and it's set up in a way that you have to have five tallies. And if you get five tallies in a badge, then you earn a badge. And then they come down to my office. I make the badge for them, usually right then and there. Although sometimes I'm out of my office, actually a lot of them out of my office. And so they just leave them for me and then I make them and bring them back down to them. Um, but we keep track of all of that. And this so, one I had to be kind of- Question. Yeah. Are you talking about like a real physical badge that they yeah. put on? And what does that yeah. look like? So they have a lanyard that they okay. all wear. So every class is like a different color. And then they just put that button on the little lanyard. And so then they wear them. So by the end of the year, we have kids that have 60, 70, 80 badges. And so they're lanyard or they may have double lanyards because they have so many yeah. badges, you know. But yeah, it's a tangible thing. It's a, it's a real thing um, that we they get right then and there. And they keep them at school. And kind of uh, usually what happens is if they earn a badge in a day, they get to wear their lanyard. And so they kind of, it's a pride thing, you know? Okay. So, and um, so, so those are like, uh, little buttons that you like push mm -hmm. pin on. Right. Is that uh, what you're talking about? yeah. So I have, I have a little one inch button maker and yeah. I just make them. Yep. So just I've got, it. I've got like six. Yep. Yep. I've got like six different, um, like 64 compartment containers on my uh, wall. So I just pull out the drawer that they have, make it for them. Takes about 10 seconds for me to make one takes about as long for me to make one as it does for them to put it on the form. So, that's awesome. How cool. Yeah, they they love them and I love doing them too. So and you can see like this year so far I've made and the kids have earned 2,397 badges so far. Wow. So yeah, so it's been kind of cool. So this one's uh, this one is a little bit more complicated because I don't want um, I don't want it to become competitive between classrooms. Right. So it to be very careful um, because, you know, there's always some teachers that say, well, this teacher has 600 badges that they've earned and I've only given out 200, then I'm just going to start throwing them out. And then it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, yeah. it's not impactful for them. So we really preach a lot that however many you give out, that's the right number for you because everybody's classroom management's different, you know? So that's the thing with, um, like whole school initiatives is sometimes you make teachers conform to something that doesn't fit their style very well. This is a program that, pretty much anybody can wrap their heads around and be able to do within their system. So I have a leaderboard that does come up here. Just to, I have a little screen that's up in our main lobby area and you can see how many badges we've had. And so I'm actually going to switch over because this will show you. Um, this is what's seen um, by the, on our board. And so it, it has a total amount of badges that we've had. We always have a countdown to a fun day and we just had it on Friday. So I haven't updated this yet. So okay. our next day that we're going to be going to, we're going to be working towards, um, snowman day. So uh, most of the time it's just me dressing up in an inflatable during drop off and greeting kids <laughs> that way. Um, so we had wavy wacky and arm guy day on Friday. So we had a couple of those things going outside and I had a inflatable costume and, you know, just something just silly and fun and simple, like a whole class celebration thing. You'll see the top 10 students that are here and then you'll see the top Raider badges that have been earned so far. So that's, that's kind of what you know, we put this on our website as well too. So they can see that. And again, this thing is coming from the data that you've already entered. So you're not having to copy data over or do any of that kind of stuff. Nope. I don't copy anything over. Like I said, the kids put all the ent the entries in the only times that they don't or when uh, I might get a whole bunch of them down here at once. And then I may have to enter those. So I do put a little bit of time into this one. This one isn't as quite as easy as an automatic. Sometimes if, especially if I'm gone a day, I usually have a lot of badges I got to make up and 
Um, but the, the benefits are just outweigh that extra time for sure. Yeah. And just to call out one thing, you have a, your K2 school, so you've got a lost a tooth one on there. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, that one's a fun one. We actually had to limit that one to only one because we had some kids who were pulling out teeth not ready so they can earn another badge. <laughs> so we had to say only one. You only get one of those. And that's the thing with the Raider badges too that I didn't even say is, let's say you earn a good friend badge. So what's your incentive to be a good friend from there on? Well, I'll give you a level two. So I'll give you the same badge, but I have the number two on it. And then you can earn a number three or a number four or a number 100 if you can make it that far. So it's something that's not, it doesn't have an end to it. So you can always earn that next level. So that's kind of, we brought in that kind of gamification into that. Yeah, very good. And and it's a cool gamification that I appreciate that is not just digital and mm -hmm. not just physical, but that it's a combination of the two. And yeah. and I like how you're, how you're making that work. Yeah, yeah. That's been, we've been doing that one for a long time. It's been nice. So uh, the next one we have is, uh, we have our Freckle Interventions. Um, so this one is, I'm going to go down to a teacher that uses this really well here. So we use Freckle as kind of our online um, sidekick curriculum. So it uh, has ELA and it has math in there both. And so students can kind of work ahead uh, if they're higher ability or they can work behind if they're a little below grade level as well too, or right on, just depends on them. We put our map scores into that so that the path is based off of kind of where they are. And so um, anytime a so our paras look over this. So they're co-teachers on Freckle. They get on there and they might see, usually it's about once a week they get on there and they find any students who have had some struggles in a standard. And then they'll find that standard. They'll pull that student during our intervention time and then just kind of do a like a redo of it. They'll maybe do a quick teach of it. So then pull up the examples that they did. Um, and then that uh, para on a spreadsheet just inputs student's name, uh, they'll put the standard identifier and then from that, it automatically puts in the, the worded, the verbiage of the standard. So they don't have to write all of this stuff out. I have that on another spreadsheet that just looks for it. Um, and then the date that they assigned it and then whenever they completed it and that's it. So usually they said they do it about on a Monday. Typically they'll look in and they'll kind of plan out their week and then they'll type them out on a spreadsheet right away. Uh, and then work with those students throughout the week and then they pull them. So then as a teacher, what do I want to know? I want to know who's been pulled, what standards are they working on? And so again, you can pull down and pick any student that you want to and find the standards that they've been assigned. So this, this student here has only had two standards assigned to them. Uh, this is a first grade student. So one of them will happen to be a kindergarten standard. Um, and then this is their most common one. Of course, they only have one. As we get later on in the year, they might have a repeat standard that pops up often. And so as a teacher, then you know, hey, what do I need to touch on with this kid or when this unit comes up? And so I also have on here, which common classroom intervention has been assigned to their entire class the most. And so like this this one here, this K algebra think one has been assigned 14 times in this classroom. And so as a teacher, what do I want to do with that information? Well, it's math meeting time. And maybe I want to look at how we represent addition and subtraction with objects, fingers, and mental images, drawings, and sounds, et cetera. And so we might put a little activity in our math meeting once or twice a week to address that. Because if it's come up 14 times, then it's obviously something that needs to be addressed. And I did that as well for the second most common and the third most common yeah. standards so that we can pull that information. And so, and this might be different for every class and typically it is. Yeah, that, that is really powerful. And what it, what it shows is that the teacher now has data about what is needing the attention and they mm -hmm. can do something with that rather than uh, not knowing or ignoring it. They can, they can make a choice at this point, which I think is pretty amazing too. Yeah. And when you look at this class, for instance, here, the most common intervention is a kindergarten standard. The second most common, also a kindergarten standard, you know, so that's something that needs needs. And how would you find that out? Otherwise, you know, you're teaching your first grade standards. Yeah, how would you not? How would you know if they're deficient in a kindergarten standard? Well, that comes from our freckle data. So that is that's our freckle stuff. And so they look at that about once a month, uh, kind of get an idea of what to put in their math meeting. Um, that kind of goes off of there. 
Uh, the next one I'll show is behavioral data. This one is more of um, as needed. So if you have a student who's really struggling, um, you might check this to see how many times you've... So anytime a student is removed from a classroom, whether that be they just need a different place to work that's quieter, or if they were being a disruption, or, or whatever it happens to be, um, I, I collect that data or my counselor, whoever works with that student. We'll take that student, we'll process with them when they're calm or when they're working, we'll quickly just fill out a Google form, put information in there. Sometimes that information gets put into our PowerSchool program, not all the time, because some of it is just pretty minor infractions. Might just be that the student was just not working hard and they just needed a place that they could focus a little bit better at, so they got sent down. So if I can pick a student here, here's an example of a student who's come down a couple of times, um, most recently even today. This will show you why they came down. Did they come down for a calm down or was it an ownership room situation where they had to do something um, because they were kind of out of control or just out of balance with their emotions? And so the data that comes in, it's time stamped. I have a width that time they came in, um, how they were feeling on a five point scale upon entry, how they were feeling when they left, what activities they did, a quick, simple notes. Who was it that worked with them? What time did they leave? And did they have any ownership tasks as well? Um, from that data, I pull how many times they've been total in the ownership room, their total time spent in the ownership room, and how many tasks they've completed throughout that time in there. So it kind of gives you an idea of how much time are they missing in class. Um, so teachers can pull this and information anytime they want to. Um, another really cool part of this is I have a report sheet down here. So this report is something I can print and send home for parents. And so for a few of our students who are repeat vendors, we will pull this and I'm gonna pull their academic data because that's important and typically behavior does affect their academics. So I'm gonna pull all their scores. So as they have their scores, this auto populates with that. Um, it's gonna show how many ownership visits they've had each month. So a little breakdown of that. And then it's gonna give you a summary of every time they've had to come down here. So that's that notes piece that I put in, it's going to show up here. And the reason why it's only myself or my counselor putting that in is because we have to be kind of careful, you know, we don't want to put other students' names and so it's stuff like yeah. so this this is going to be seen by parents. So we have to make sure it's done the right way. But it'll show the time that they came in, the date that they came in and what it is that they came in for. Yeah. And this can be printed and we can put notes on here if we meet as a team, we can put those notes in there. The parents can put some feedback in there if they want to, to send that back. So a little two-way communication for that. Um, and, it, and it's all right there, ready to go. And I can also break this down. So this was at the beginning of the year. So if I wanted to just run one for a second quarter, I just do this little change the date right there. And then it's only gonna select those dates between today and the beginning of the quarter. Because mm -hmm. I don't need to share, we don't need to go and share those first of the year school stuff. I mean, we're in second quarter now. Let's just share what's happened so far. But this form will have, or this uh, graph here will show their total visits they've had per month. Yeah, which which is powerful also because you're you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. You've probably already sent this home for first quarter, so the mm -hmm. parents have probably already seen what happened. Then you don't need to rehash it. Don't need to make it a bigger deal than it has to be. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so you can just focus on the second quarter data. That's, that's really powerful. And, and this is good because this then gives you this overview of the student's uh, behavior during that time that, you know, may be very difficult to pull otherwise. Again, if you're using the behavior logs in PowerSchool, it doesn't look this good and doesn't no. have all their, uh, their academic scores on there as well. Right. Right. Yep. And that's the whole part of this is getting all of that stuff together, you know, because the mm -hmm. academic scores come from MAP, they come from Acadiance, the behavior stuff comes from PowerSchool, and there's no way you're going to get all three of those things to communicate and talk with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, really, really incredible. Is there is there anything else that you need to show us from this? Uh, yeah. So I also do a breakdown for the school as well, too. And I want to compare that to last year so we can kind of see exactly how the year is gone and we can compare it to the year before. So I keep track of all of that as well. So how many times students have been in the ownership room, if they've had office referrals. Uh, this year I did add a classwork because I had a lot of students that came down just for classwork. They're not in trouble, but they needed another place to work that was quiet that they could focus. And yeah. so some of these ownership rooms from last year 
are actually just class work. So I did add that little piece. It's a little different, but we can compare to the year before. And so we, as a staff talked because in October, I had 42 students that had to come down and visit me, had to be removed from class as compared to last year when we had eight. So yeah. something's going on. So we had some PD on, Hey, what is going on? And it was a lot of just talking to the teachers about, you know, what kind of things are you seeing? How can we be proactive to stay in front of that? Um, and then November went down drastically. It went down from 42 down to 19, um, uh, which was actually a little less than the year before. Yeah. So that, that, that's the data, you know, me as a principal, I'm sitting here and the kids are coming down here and it seems overwhelming and it seems crazy. And I can say, wow, yeah, I had 42 students come and visit me throughout that whole month. You know, so that was, that's helpful. Yeah. Well, and what's, what's so interesting about that piece specifically is, uh, when I, when I became an assistant principal in a, at an elementary school, they said that I was going to have a line outside my door. And I was like, uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> that is not going to happen. We're not going to do things that way. And I started keeping data like, like you have here, not as organized or as nicely as you have. But I saw very quickly what the problems were, where the problems were happening, who the, what classroom they were coming from. And then we just started working on those specific things. And sure enough, in a very short amount of time, uh, the problems stopped showing up like they were before. And I just think that that is, uh, that is really powerful. So yeah, uh, yeah, Rick, this is just amazing. You've done some really cool stuff here. I'm really impressed and, and proud of what you've done. Uh, if somebody wants to start moving in this direction, what's the one thing that you would say they need to start doing this week to get a more effective data hub for their teachers? Well, I think it's, it's kind of figure out how that data is going to be entered, you know, and who's going to be doing the entering of it. Um, and, and what, do, what do you want to collect? You know, I, I've talked to even the other schools in my district and there's a lot of stuff that I collect that other schools, they just don't want. And so it's kind of a matter of, starting right off the bat of what do you want teachers to see and have at their fingertips? And then how can we make it so that we don't have to copy paste all the time, make copies of documents. We can just keep one thing going. This data hub that I have, I don't ever change it. It stays put. So when the year is over, I make a copy of this and the copy becomes my archived and my new one, all I have to do is wipe out all of our, t our classroom list names and update with the new ones. You know, all of that work is it's already done. I don't have to do it over again. So that's the big part of it is it just what do you want to collect and what do you want that to look like? Because chances are, if you can get it in a, in a sheet, a spreadsheet of some sort, you can push it and make it do whatever you want. Man, this is this is awesome. Rick, thank you so much for being part of Transformative Principal and for sharing your expertise with everyone out there. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on here. I love sharing stuff like this, and um, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to share this to a bigger audience in just my district. Yeah, very cool. <laughs>